Good afternoon. Uh, welcome, faculty, students, friends, and ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the second lecture of the Winston uh, Co. Public Lecture Series. And uh, my name is uh, Ting Guo, and I'm the chair of uh, Chemistry Department, who is, uh, which is responsible for organizing this year's lecture. And uh, today we're very excited and uh, honored to uh, welcome uh, uh, Professor Dennis Hero from Harvard to give the lecture. And uh, uh, he will be introduced in a moment, uh, in a moment by our Dean um, Nebraski. And so I will take a brief moment to introduce uh, uh, Professor Nebraski, distinguished professor from uh, four departments in our uh, school, which includes uh, chemical engineering and material science, uh, chemistry, land, air, and water resources, and the geology. Uh, Professor Nevrosky obtained uh, her uh, bachelor degree in 1963 and a PhD in 1967, so it's a short time ago, uh, from University of Chicago. After postdoctoral training, and uh, she joined uh, Arizona State University uh, faculty in the departments of uh, chemistry and the geology and stayed there till 1985. Uh, then she moved to Princeton in 1980, uh, 19, oh, sorry. So she, she stayed in Arizona for 90, till, 90, till 1985, then moved to Princeton uh, and stayed in Princeton till 97. And then she joined faculty in Davis, hired as an interdisciplinary prof professor in four departments. Uh, she then initiated um, and became the director of NEED, who is, which is uh, nanomaterials in the environment, agriculture, and, the trans and the technology, and organized the interdisciplinary research unit. Uh, professor, oh, so I don't, I don't mean to give the talk. <laughs> uh, professor Nimrowski has been the interim dean uh, of the math and the physical science division in the College of Letters and the Science uh, in the last four years. And uh, she is the executive officer of the code lectureship. She has published over 800 pup, uh, papers and has been awarded many times in her career. And not noticeably, the Benjamin Franklin Medal in Earth Science and uh, W. David Kin Kingery Award of the American Ceramic Society. Uh, Professor, Professor Nemorowski also is a member of the National Academy of Sciences uh, since 1993. Without further delay, let's please join me in welcoming Professor Nemorowski. Thank you, Ting. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I'm recovering from a broken leg. I'm 90% recovered. Biomineralization is wonderful. <laughs> uh, it is a great pleasure, indeed, and an honor to welcome all of you to the second in the Winston Co. Public Lecture Series, Frontiers in Mathematical and Physical Sciences. This program is made possible by a generous donation from Winston Co. Professor Emeritus of Physics and his family and friends. Uh, Winston is also Dean Emeritus of the Division of Mathematical and Physical Sciences and uh, a eminent physicist in his own right who has done many things for the university where he has been even far longer than I have been. So it gives me great pleasure then to announce that the gift from Winston and his family has been augmented indeed by donations, general, generous donations from many of his colleagues and friends such that it has now exceeded that magic threshold of a million dollars and we can announce then that the Winston Co. professorship uh, in mathematical and physical sciences is coming to be 
We anticipate that the lecture series as well will continue and within a fairly short time on the university timescale, we will have picked a recipient of the professorship. So I'd like to take this opportunity to ask Winston and his family, I believe his wife, his daughter and granddaughter are here, uh, so that we can acknowledge him and his generosity. Last, last year, we inaugurated the lecture series with Veronica Hubeni, professor of physics, who talked about black holes, and we had a very successful lecture. This year, we have the honor and the pleasure of a visit by Professor Daniel Nocera, Patterson Rockwell, professor of energy, Department of Chemistry and Chemical Biology at Harvard University. He received his bachelor's degree at Rutgers, his PhD at Caltech. He started his faculty position at Michigan State and then moved to MIT and later to Harvard. He has mentored close to 150 PhD students and postdoctoral fellows. Uh, he has published over 400, and perhaps that's an old number, scientific papers. His research bridges chemistry, biology, material science, with emphasis on the basic mechanisms of energy transfer. And indeed, in talking to him this morning, he indicated that really the basic science behind the applications is fascinating and continues to be one of his major uh, goals. Indeed, then, uh, nature has perfected solar energy conversion by photosynthesis in green plants and other organisms with chlorophyll. Uh, the use of sunlight to split the water molecule, the H2O molecule, allowing its hydrogen to react with atmospheric carbon dioxide to make organic molecules, and releasing the oxygen, of course, into the air. And we talk in Earth Sciences about the great oxygenation event that changed our atmosphere from being reducing to being oxidizing. So releasing the oxygen into the air for us and other organisms to breathe. Nocera has engineered the artificial leaf and later the bionic leaf, that is a uh, electronic and mechanical and chemical apparatus that does artificial photosynthesis really with greater efficiency than nature does because it does not have some of the uh, boundary conditions that living organisms have to live under. This scientific discovery and technological invention has set a course, really, for the large-scale development of solar energy and renewable energy in general, especially in the developing world, but really everywhere. His work has led to much recognition and honors, membership certainly in the National Academy of Sciences, the American Chemical Society Award for Inorganic Chemistry, the Italian ENI Prize, and many, many others. I don't want to take uh, his lecture time to give all of his honors and awards. He is an inspiring and dynamic lecturer in both the scientific and public forum. And indeed, today his talk will focus perhaps more on the public uh, forum aspects. Tomorrow he will be giving a more technical talk in the chemistry department. And the topic of his talk today, then, is the sustaining a new epoch. I remind you, then, that geology has divided the history of the Earth into different epochs, which end in the word scene, uh, Holocene, for example. And now, of course, we have sometimes called our era the anthro Anthropocene because we have such an influence on it. And optimistically, we have to transform that into something that is sustainable. And that, I believe, is what Dan is going to talk to us about. So it is a pleasure to introduce Dan Nocera. So uh, first, I'd like to thank UC Davis for having me and um, being able to present two lectures. Dr. Koh, uh, it's really nice to be here to find out you'll be forever because of all the kind people who gave money 
to the lectureship and in honor of his name. When you see that, you know somebody was really special to the university, so I know how special you must have been. And then, of course, Alex for just giving me a very, very nice uh, introduction. And you know how smart she is because usually when you give these introductions, you write them and you send them and then people read them. Um, so she did that and then realized it was kind of a flaky introduction and she went much deeper. I was listening to her. Um, she gave you a lot of scientific insight that was well beyond what I wrote and tells you how much science she knows. That was probably more impressive than what you're going to hear right now. So don't hold that against me. And then, and of course, the entire chemistry department for sponsoring this in MPS. So one of the things that she just mentioned is epics. And so here's a new epic, sustainacy. Now, why would I do that? It turns out I spent most of my career at MIT. And MIT is a nice place because you can just be a scientist and engineer. And that's good enough because that's the whole place. But when you go to Harvard, <laughs> being a scientist and engineer isn't enough. You have to do something for the hum humanists. So when I got there, I decided I just better invent a new epic so they would notice me. <laughs> so that's the real reason behind this uh, sustainacine um, word. And like you heard, it is a geological epic. And so this is the one you're actually in, and it's called the Holocene. And it was, it's really the one you're in now. It started around 10,000 years ago. And that is an epic where first we have human activity on the face of the planet. But you can tell, and by the way, when you give public lectures for students in here, what you spend most of your time doing is going on Google and finding pictures evocative of the words you're going to use. So these pictures are evocative of the Holocene, meaning it's a beautiful world and human activity hasn't affected it. And that is what we are in today, human activities don't affect the natural systems of the world, except I said until 1800. And then we had this new word called the Anthropocene, and now there's so much human activity, look what we're doing, we're interfering with uh, human earth systems, because there's just so many of us, and we have such need in our life that now, you start to wonder, can you ever have a world like this when we're so taxing to the earth because of the need to keep us going? And so this word Anthropocene came up, and that means human new. And the thing most tightly uh, connected to the Anthropocene is things like what we're doing to the atmosphere, CO2 emission. But I will tell you that's a very narrow, narrow definition. It's what we're doing to natural resources, what we're doing to food. Um, I know because this is Davis, people know that here. You are all in big trouble with just the element phosphorus. You don't realize that yet. That's not as widely discussed as what we're doing with CO2 in the atmosphere. But we've been just taking phosphorus out of the earth system and you're all gonna be in big trouble in a hundred years because of phosphorus, but by that time you'll have messed up so badly you won't even know that phosphorus was down the road because you'll have taken care of yourself with carbon dioxide, so congratulations. Okay, so what I wanna do today is talk about is there a way out of this, this quandary and can we start to reverse it back to here? Now, before I do that, and, and what I want to do is set up the problem we chose in science. And so the problem we chose is this one. And you think about sustainability and environmental integrity. And when you do that, the picture you think about is green plants and greenness and the beautiful blue earth. So that's what this picture is trying to indicate. And about a sustainable world. 
the message I want to share with you today, and this is how we think about sustainability usually, and how the press covers sustainability. What I want to talk about today is this is actually impossible to take care of until, un unless you put the human equation in there. And my argument, and I'm going to try to prove this to you, so now I'm going to do the humanist thing and use words and then completely wreck it with an equation because that's what scientists do. But I'm going to show you with an equation that you can't have a sustainable earth unless you take care of people, especially poverty. So if you have poverty, I'm going to guarantee you, you can't have this, right? And so that kind of reorients the problem for us. Rather than attacking this problem, how do I keep the earth green? The problem we chose is how do I get people out of poverty and then the argument is the only way to get them out of poverty is to give them energy. And if you've ever thought about it, money actually is energy. So wealth, it's not paper. I know America's decided that they will just service paper and try to make profits off of trading paper. That's called a service-based economy. Um, no, it's energy. If you have energy, you have wealth. Now, why do I say that? And I'll get to that. Now, first, before I do that, I just reminded myself on the next slide. What, there's two challenges with taking care of this. And one is this idea of self. And I'm going to use another word. This is one of my favorite words in the English language, solipsism. And solipsism is even worse than being egocentric. All right, so it's, a, it's, an, it's an idea, it's a philosophical idea. And it's the most egocentric people in the world. This is why I love it. Especially if you get to know me, you'll understand why I became infatuated with this work. Solipsism is you actually don't even exist right now. The only reason why you exist is because in my mind, I've allowed you to be there. And if I decide right now that you don't exist, you all evaporate from this room. So it's, that's what the word solipsism is. It's that only in one's mind is there any existence or is there sure existence. And the reason why this idea and concept is so important in the energy game is I told you you want to have a sustainable earth. You need to take care of the poor. And what is a little bit sad is that the world we see in our solipsistic way, the world that exists is only the one we can see. And we don't really live in a world of poverty. We look and see poverty over there, but we don't experience poverty on the whole. And so the real danger is that there's only three billion of you that exist in this yellow circle. There's going to be six to seven billion of you that exist in this circle outside of what you can see. And these are the people, the three billion that are in the emerging world who aren't using much energy. There'll be three billion new people born and they're being born in that part of the world. And we aren't really doing anything for them because they aren't in our existence. It's not that you're to be faulted. For instance, if science tries to do something for them, there's not even a mechanism to fund a scientist who wakes up in the morning and says, I want to develop energy for the poor, because we usually get our money from federal sources or industrial sources. Industry can't make money in this part of the world, so they're not too interested in it. And you know, to be frank with you, the, it's the Department of Energy and like a past Secretary of Energy, Sam Bodman, who I respected and loved a lot. He was a chem engineer who ran the, who was Secretary of Energy. I once, when I was starting to think about this several years ago, I mentioned this to Sam Bodman in a lecture like this and was really obnoxious. And then he looked at me and said, as I was making this argument, we need to do energy for the poor. 
he reminded me, Professor Nocera, may I remind you, I'm the Secretary of Energy of the United States of America. And that's actually a powerful statement because taxpayers' dollars are to take care of their immediate problem. And it's hard for them to understand that if you don't take care of this pro problem or challenge, the six billion poor, that it's actually going to be their problem down the line. So it's not to blame or finger point, but the real argument is it's for energy, in my view, you need to take care of this emerging world and the people coming into it. Now, why do I say that? And it's because of this relation. So this isn't an equation. An equation is variable function. This is an identity relation. So in math, that means if I say energy, it's exactly saying what I'm saying on the right side. So what am I saying on the right side? You only need to know three variables for energy. And if you know those, you can calculate energy. So what are they? One is I need to know population. So people use energy. And you can calculate how much energy you use. And what I'm going to do in this talk is not talk about energy. I'm going to talk about power. So what is power? It's energy per unit time. So when you see a 100 watt light bulb, there's energy to keep the light bulb on, but all you know is there's a 100 watt light bulb burning continually. So I'm going to talk about power. The advantage of that is you don't need to worry about every time I use a number, am I using it for today, a year, a week, because it's energy per unit time. So <clears throat> in this equation, I could calculate, have you ever calculated how bright a light bulb you are? It's easy. So you take your caloric intake in a day. So most, I will just use 2,000 calories. I'm going to be nerdy here for the public. I can, choose, I can change calories to joules, and it turns out, and then I can divide by 24 hours, and I can get power. So if you, eat, if you take in 2,000 calories per day, you're a 100 watt light bulb. And since I'm in California and you're so energy advanced, you're a 110 watt light bulb. You're a little bit brighter than the rest of the United States. But isn't that nice? So that says for your existence, you're no different than a 100 watt light bulb. And that's kind of interesting. What's this number? That is the energy around the necessary 100 watts of you. So this is gross domestic product per capita. So if you live in a wealthy country, then you have more energy around you to keep you going. So there's energy at your house, and there's energy for manufacturing. And so if I know, I can look up in the web and see gross domestic product per person. So if I know that number, I can calculate how much energy is around you. In America, there's another 1,000 watts around you at home. So you need 100 watts to live. You're spending 1,000 watts at home, so that's 1,100 watts. And then when I just take all the manufacturing around you, cars and everything else, that's another 10,000 watts. So for an American, you're 11,100 watts. And that is what you need plus what is around you, depending on how wealthy you are as a society. And then here's the last number, which is an interesting one, and that's energy intensity. And that means I have to, I told you money is GDP. And so last year I hit this GDP as a country. Next year I hit the same GDP and I used X amount of less energy. That means I conserved energy. I was able to maintain the same level of wealth, but I used less energy. I conserved. If the next year I need more energy, I didn't conserve. So the reason why this number is super interesting is when you hear people use conservation, it kind of sounds like a wishy-washy term. What's conservation? You can actually measure it quantitatively. I just need to know how much energy you're using per GDP. 
And if you keep using less and less energy and you're able to maintain your GDP, that means you're conserving. And now when I multiply all this together, and numerator, denominator, upstairs, downstairs goes away, upstairs, downstairs goes away, energy is energy. So that's kind of neat, because with those three numbers, I can calculate energy very accurately. And so I did that a few years ago using that equation. I published a paper on this. And I was able to show you're using 16 terawatts equivalents of energy. So remember, that's power. So it's an energy equivalent. So what does that mean? The world right now is burning a 16 trillion watt light bulb. It's on all the time. And you're feeding it energy to keep it on, and you all know you're feeding it mostly coal, oil, and gas. 80% of that 16 terawatts is coal, oil, and gas to keep the light bulb on. I can look to the future and calculate your energy, and the number I get is you're going to need 16 more. So in the future, and the future is 2050, I can choose any time. It's always good to choose middle of centuries and end of centuries. It's easy for people to get their head around. So in 35 years, take the littlest child you know and add 35 years to their life, and this is the world they're going to be in. They're going to need 16 terawatts more of energy. And how did I do that? I extrapolated forward. Now, here's a very UC Davis story I want to say, share with you. This is from Eric Morris at UCLA, but I, he actually did this when he was at Davis in the transportation program here. And what he did in this story is what I just did in energy. I'm, ex I'm saying there's six billion of you, three billion low energy users. I'm going to look to the future. There's going to be 10 billion of you. How much energy are you going to need? This story is doing the same thing, but it was with horse manure. So this is true. In 1898, delegates from across the globe gathered in New York City to do urban planning. And this is the term, beginning of the Industrial Revolution. So I don't know what you would think they would worry about. It should be housing, electrification, street economic development, infrastructure. Nope, the whole conference was on horse manure. So why was it on horse manure? Because they said, look at, here are wealthy people, because they can own expensive cars. They can own horse and buggies. And we can see how much horse manure comes out of the back of them. We know how much a horse puts out. And so here is wealthy people. We have economic development. It's going to explode. All these people are going to own horses. When they own horses, with the people who already own horses, so here we are, the developed world has energy. Here's the developing world. They're going to be owning energy, just like they owned horses. This was an easy calculation, just like it was an easy calculation for me to do energy, because I just have to weigh the amount of manure coming out of a horse. And when you do that, in 1894, the Times of London estimated by 1950, I chose 2050, half century rule, um, every street in London would be nine feet deep in horse manure. And in New York City, they predicted that horse droppings by 1930 would reach the third story of every window. People sat there for three days. They could not come up with a solution. So they did what everybody does when you can't do, come up with a solution. You cancel the conference and everybody went home. That's exactly what happened here. So this is an amazing thing, and I want the people who don't do science to think about it. Because this is what scientists do, in case you don't know what we're doing in our little holes that you give us money for. Um, we're supposed to make these problems go away by inventing and creating. And think about this problem. This is in 1898. Uh, Benz had already made the motor wagon in Germany in the mid-1860s. The internal combustion was invented. In the mid-1800s, we were drilling oil out of the ground, and the car was about to be mass-manufactured, but nobody could see it. 
So this problem went away and put us in our new problem, CO2, because we were just going over to a fossil-based uh, society and the automobile was going to show up. So that's why none of you, except if you go to UC Davis transportation um, curricula, that's why none of you knew this pro problem existed. And that's called a paradigm shift, right? So that's what scientists do, because what I was doing is extrapolating to the future from a known point. What you're supposed to do as a scientist is change the extrapolation point. So when you go to the future, it's not as bad. And this went away. So the first thing is I wanted to sh share this with you because it's a paradigm shift. It's exactly what I'm doing with energy. I'm extrapolating from the future from a known point, And now you're not going to be buried nine feet deep in horse manure. You're going to be nine feet deep in carbon dioxide. The other reason I'm showing you this is I told you this problem went away. What does that prove to you? Shift happens. <laughs> I worked really hard for that one. <laughs> so what I want to do is tell you today, at a very personal level, my group, about some shift happening. All right, so now every time I say shift, you know what I really mean with the horse manure crisis. Okay, so what's some shift that's happening? Let's return to the 16 terawatt number. I said you're going to need 16 more. The, that's easy to calculate because I'm going to say I know what the population is in 2050. I know what GDP per capita is in case you've never looked it up. The entire global earth economy has been growing at 2.3 percent per year for the last 100 years on global average. So I'll use that for my GDP per capita. But the number I have to estimate is what the what the energy intensity is, the conservation. And when I did this calculation, I made the assumption that every bit of energy you use today, you'll be saving in the future. So my assumption is through technology development, you will save 16 terawatts by 2050. So that's kind of scary because I'm telling you, if you meet that mark, you still need 16 terawatts more. So what that tells you is conservation isn't good enough. It's necessary, but it's not going to solve this problem. And then you can ask, if you chose such an aggressive energy intensity number, that last term of my three-term equation, why do you need 16 terawatts? And I already told you, this is the sustain a scene. And this is why I'm telling you, it's because if you don't take care of the poor, which is six billion who are low energy users, you aren't going to be able to have a sustainable earth if they end up reproducing what the three billion are doing now. So if you think you have carbon dioxide problems in 2017, wait for 2050 when six billion new energy users are fully coming on board and they're all using fossil fuels. So that, I told you, I would mathematically prove to you that if you don't focus on the poor, you can't have a sustainable earth. It's that simple. So that's set for us, and I'm really leading you through how we chose our research problem. If I want to then attack greenhouse gas emissions and I'm worried about sustainability, I better figure out what invention I'm going to do for poor people. And that means I have to do a different type of science. Because for, and I'm calling it non-legacy world, meaning you in this society and most developed societies, you've inherited an energy system. You have a legacy. So you have $12 trillion infrastructure for fossil fuels. The reason why you aren't adopting ener new energy quickly, it's not because you're mean or you're negligent. It's because in the last 100 years, you invested $12 trillion and you paid it off. So it's very cheap. It's that simple. Coal, oil, and gas are very cheap for one reason. You, you've already built the power plants. 
you know how to dig it out of the ground, all that capital's paid off, you have railroads and pipelines to ship it, you built it, it's all paid off. So what invention am I going to build for the legacy world or make that's going to displace $12 trillion? None. There is no scientist that's going to come up with one invention to displace a $12 trillion paid off investment. I hate to say it. All right. So the challenge for this world is to start pricing carbon and say, what is the true price of carbon? And there's a real price, because if I keep putting a lot in the atmosphere, there are all these health problems. If, if we see rising water levels, you guys are going to pay huge amounts of money to build dams and do engineering uh, projects to keep your financial centers, and it's going to cost you lots of money. But that's not in the price right now. That's, you're just paying for the paid off piece. In the non-legacy world, they haven't built that infrastructure. So I don't have to fight as hard with my inventions. So that's good, because I don't have to fight a paid off infrastructure. And that's where energy is needed most. So it sounds like this is a good place to be. But the problem is it has to be low capital expenditure, because they don't have a lot of money and it's got to be simple. And it better be distributed because to build a centralized infrastructure costs a lot of money. All right, so that's number one. And if I'm going to be low capex and distributed, I'm going to say you have to have simple engineering because if it gets complicated engineering, that costs lots of money. And to have Simple engineering, it means you need to be lightweight and highly manufacturable. So why do I say lightweight and highly manufacturable? So this is what I do. Dave Britt knows this. I can't do an experiment to save my life anymore. I'm 59 years old. I haven't been in the lab for 20 years. I don't even know what the heck my graduate students are doing and what their instruments are. So what do I do for research? I go into my office and I make Google plots. And then I run into the lab and say, look what I discovered. And then my graduate students walk me back into my office. They sit me down and they go back in the lab and they do important stuff. And then I, so they won't listen to me, but since you're my captive audience, you can now listen to my latest discovery on my Google plot. So what I did is I went in Google and I said, how many planes were built in 2008, Boeing 777s? How much did they weigh? And how much did they cost? I took the cost and divided by weight. That's all I did. I didn't want to know anything else about the technology. Then on this axis, I said, how many did they make? And in that year, they made 74 uh, Boeing 777s. Then I did it for etching tools, machine tools, and automobiles. So I did it for anything that you manufacture a lot, machines. And so this is an interesting graph because I have a curve now to tell you what cost is simply based on weight and how many you make. That's it. If I know the weight and how much, how many they make, I can predict the cost of manufacturing with this curve. Now, what, why is this up here in the car down there? Because this doesn't work for three things, commodity chemicals, it doesn't work for Intel chips, IT, because there's a different cost there, huge development cost. To make it, once, you know, once you've developed it, it's actually very cheap, but you gotta, there's a development cost. And the other thing it doesn't work for is pills, pharma. The reason there is because you will pay anything for the magic pill to stay alive forever. So you'll invest lots of money for hope. The problem with energy is there is no hope. You already have it. And, and it's very capital intensive. It's not like IT, information technology, where you can get a few kids in a dorm room at Harvard and they invent Facebook and they invent Microsoft. Okay, that just doesn't happen with energy. You gotta make stuff and go into society and try to re displace a $12 trillion investment. So this works for manufactured goods right here. And that Boeing 77 has a lot of Intel chips on it. That's the only reason why that cost is up there. But once you get down to regular stuff that doesn't have lots of Intel chips, you get the other interesting thing is you're never cheaper than $10 per pound. And it works for anything 
that you make a lot of and you manufacture. And this is no joke. And this really isn't. I gave a talk like this and the CTO of McDonald's was in the audience, which is also mind boggling that McDonald's has a chief technology officer, but they do. And he, I had him go back and I said, how much does the bun, the lettuce, the tomato, cheese, and patty weigh? Perfect, $10 per pound. All right, so the only thing here is I should have a squiggle and then infinity, because 100 million a year is a low number for manufacturing at McDonald's. Now, why is this curve interesting? How do you guys build energy systems in the developed world? You build one thing, it's super heavy, you multiply $10 per pound and you get $2 billion or $1.5 billion. So you need a $1.5 billion investment to build your energy system, say your power um, company. And then what do I do? You're rich, so I can set up a business model where I now own the energy. I can then sell you the energy. I can recover my capital expenditure, the $1.5 billion to build this, and make a profit. And that's centralized energy. That works because I own the energy. You don't, I'll distribute it to you. Reason why this doesn't work in the world, the non-legacy world, is they don't have money to give you for your return on investment. So that's what's saving you, whether you realize it or not, for a sustainable planet, all right? So they haven't built this massive infrastructure because nobody's been interested to build it for them because they couldn't collect money back. The other way to say this, so that's one way. I always take, and I teach my students to do this, go the opposite direction and make the argument. So if you don't understand what I just said, Think about McDonald's with a business model for energy, the way we sell energy in the developed world. How would that look? Did you ever think of it? McDonald's would make one big hamburger. You would all drive to it, take a bite out of it, and then drive home. All right, so that would be the business model for a centralized energy system for McDonald's. So it becomes pretty simple then. If that doesn't work, then you should cast your eyes to the other side of the curve. And we started wondering, could I make an energy system that's small enough, that's like a hamburger? How does McDonald's work? They have distributed chains. They make a lot of them, and they hand them out. So can I make the McDonald's hamburger of energy? And that's how we came, that, honestly, that was the line of reasoning to everything I'm about to tell you right now, okay? So, first you've got to figure out your energy source. I don't want to belabor this. By the way, my students say this looks so creepy. Um, if, so it's what energy source follows you everywhere. It smiles when you talk to it with its warmth. Do you ever think of that? And more energy comes from her in one hour than you use in the entire year globally. Did you ever realize that? That's what she does. And so you should be using her. When you feel her on you and you say it's warm, she's not saying I'm warm. She's saying, use me, use me, use me. That's when I feel the sun. That's what I keep thinking she's telling me. And that's an amazing number. It's true. In one hour, the amount of solar hitting the face of the planet is more than you're using globally. But you're just not harnessing and using it. So that sounds like a good energy source. And the everywhere is really important. If I'm going to go to the poor, they need to have access to an energy supply because it's not going to be centralized. That's the beauty of solar, is everybody has access to it. And so the question is, how do you harness that in a non-legacy world? That, that's the question. And so that's where you turn to leaves, because leaves are highly manufacturable. They're distributed, and they use solar energy. Now, what people forget about photosynthesis, and it's key to what we did, is when the sun is shining on the leaf, it's splitting water, H2O, to hydrogen and oxygen. So it takes the bonds of water and rearranges them to hydrogen and oxygen. Now, 
nature doesn't use gaseous hydrogen. It stores it in a solid form called NADPH. So just think about it as solid hydrogen and oxygen. And that's what the leaf uses the sun for. It doesn't need the sun to make biomass, glucose, cellulose. That it doesn't need any sun for because hydrogen plus carbon dioxide is a thermoneutral. You don't need to have an energy input. As a matter of fact, for most things, it's downhill. It releases energy. So once I have hydrogen from water, I'm good to go with carbon dioxide. I don't need the sun anymore. Okay, so that's number one. And I'm going to put this now in terms of fossil fuels. What's a fossil fuel? A fossil fuel is solar. It's just been put in the ground. And it's taken because of compression of matter. You get rich energy bonds, carbon-carbon and carbon-hydrogen bonds. What you do then is you burn them with oxygen. And you rearrange these bonds to these bonds, CO2 and water. That's our new problem, CO2. And you go to a lower energy content bond, and then you, you harness the energy to use it. So what you've done is, in photosynthesis, you take low energy bonds, water, just like here, I rearrange them with the sun to make hydrogen and oxygen. In doing that, I've stored the sun's energy in the rearranged bonds of water. That's how you can think of it. And I've made a fuel, hydrogen and oxygen, and I can store that fuel and use it any time I want. Right? Now, that's profound because I'm going to show you in a more science way. This is the photosynthetic membrane that takes water with the sun. So the sun shines on the leaf, and it's this apparatus that splits water to hydrogen and oxygen. And I've split the hydrogen up into its parts, protons and electrons. Then the hydrogen combines with carbon dioxide to make carbohydrate. You eat the carbohydrate. You release the hydrogen, again, in a solid energy form. That stays in your body. You breathe out the CO2 that the plant fixed with hydrogen to make carbohydrate. So the first thing you're doing today is you're eating the carbohydrate, you're keeping the hydrogen inside of you, because that's the energy-rich fuel, and you get rid of the carbon dioxide out of your mouth. The hydrogen then gets fed to oxygen that you breathe in, and in your mitochondria, in an enzyme called cytochrome C oxidase, which is nature's fuel cell, that enzyme recombines the hydrogen and oxygen, and you get all the energy back, and then you make water. And that gives you cellular energy, called mitochondrial respiration. Look at this full Earth system. I have photosynthesis making carbohydrate from water and sunlight and carbon dioxide, and then you're eating it and you're getting everything back. So let's start, look, you had water, well, you had carbohydrate, made it with photosynthesis using the sun, then you ate it. So they cancel. The hydrogen and carbon dioxide that came from water splitting and the plant took in, you keep and then you expel. So that's on the other side of the arrow, that goes away. Look at everything that was done in photosynthesis, you're undoing inside your body. So everything's gone, except for one thing. What's over here? Sun. Over here, a cellular energy. If, if there's one take-home message I want you to remember, when you eat food, what do you think you're chewing? You're chewing the sun. I'm not kidding you. The sun has just rearranged the same atoms, and then you're eating it. If the sun has stored its energy in rearranged bonds of atoms. You eat it. The plant takes them back in, and then you eat it. Today, when you eat the food, just understand deeply you're chewing the sun. You just have photosynthesis and cytochrome C oxidase in between to manage taking solar light to cellular energy. That's all that's happening. So that's worked for 2.5 billion years. I am the ultra conservative in the energy argument. Fossil fuels, they're liberals, right? Because I don't want anything to change. 
I want to keep what's worked for 2.5 billion years. It's these radical liberals who in the last 100 years have started a new energy system, like oil companies. So I'm the ultra-conservative Tea party or Oil companies, coal, oil, and gas, crazy liberals. You can't get more conservative than I am. They don't want anything to change for 2.5 billion years. So let me tell you how much energy you could, so now I'm gonna make a hamburger, don't know how to do that yet, but if I could make a hamburger and then operate on the Harvard pool of water, the hardest thing in this calculation is finding out how many liters of water is in the Harvard pool, it's 2.8 million liters of water. Um, if I make a little hamburger, distribute it globally, there's sun following you everywhere, and the hamburger operates on a pool of water globally per second. Now, I'm not using that water up per second because when the water, hydrogen and oxygen recombine, I get the energy back in water. So I'm just cycling water, just like I showed you before. We're cycling everything. We're just converting solar energy into useful energy. If I could make a hamburger that operates globally on one swimming pool of water, guess how much energy? Equivalence. I told you you need 16, 38 terawatts. Isn't that remarkable? So I need one third a swimming pool of water per second globally with the hamburger in the sun, and I can take care of your 16 terawatts with no carbon, right? So that's interesting. That's why, by the way, plants chose water as its energy target to store its energy, because you store so much energy in it. So how do you go from here to here? I have to emulate photosynthesis. People have been talking about this for over 100 years. So here's the solar photochemist, the first one, Chimichan. He was an Italian in Bologna. And what he would do is just put chemicals in beakers, put them on the roof of the chemistry department in Bologna. And only if he saw something happen, he would study it. If nothing happened, he would just pour it down the drain. So he was the first solar photochemist. And in 1912, he said, if we could replace coal, oil, and gas with sunlight, that would be good for human progress and happiness. And he said to fix solar energy through the photochemical processes that are guarded secret of plants. So people have been talking about this a long time. I'm just gonna tell you quickly how photosynthesis works, but from a functional point of view. Sunlight comes in, you separate charge. So leaves are buzzing with electricity. When sunlight comes in, the plant can't get its hands around photons, so it moves charge. Moving charge is current, but it doesn't use wires. It takes the current, now it's energized current, and there are catalysts, or what are called cofactors in the plant, that then operate, use the energized solar current, but not in wires, to split water to oxygen and hydrogen. So we said, could we make something that catches light makes an energized wireless current, and then operate on it to split water to make oxygen and hydrogen. And that's what I need the sunlight for, like I told you. And then in the dark, could I figure out someday how to make carbohydrate? So I'm not gonna go through all the chemistry, but these students over here figured out that you can oxidize cobalt two to three, that's a metal in the periodic table. So you just take a glass of water, you put the element in there, the metal ion, and in the presence of, phos presence of phosphate, you form that molecule. It makes a little thin coating, and that thing, when you energize it, that compound, it splits water to oxygen and hydrogen. I'm not gonna tell you how it works. Tomorrow I'll tell you some details. And some, a, a lot of this has very UC Davis in it. So Dave Britt, Dr. Britt here, was in helping us figure the, how this works. Dr. Casey is one of the world's experts in minerals. This is actually a mineral. And the way you find out that how they help you, and Dr. Casey's point, is every paper I submitted, he would say, you dummy, this is already known. It's a mineral, no, Sarah. So that's how I learned all that stuff. So thank you, Bill, for all of his re reviews. They were very insightful. Now, what's beautiful about this, I'm not gonna tell you how I did it, but that's self-healing. It fixes itself in real time. It's one of the few catalysts that knows how to always rejuvenate itself. That means I can use any water source. If I'm going to go to the port and I need super pure water, I'm dead. 
So in this thing, you can take a puddle off the ground, super dirty water, because the catalyst knows how to fix itself. You can use urine. So why would you do that? First, you take your most annoying graduate student, Yogi, and you make them do the urine experiments. That's how you get back at them. And then the second reason is that's one water source that's available everywhere. And when I recombine hydrogen and oxygen, what do you get? Clean drinking water. So we set out to do, make a catalyst that operated on any water. Now you get the extra bonus. I have a way to purify water in the process of getting the energy back. Extra value. The other thing is I can use any water source meaning natural waters, and that means it's not corrosive to materials. Water is pretty benign, and I can interface it to biology, bioorganisms. So by doing the self-healing, that was the key discovery, I can now start to do things like take my catalyst, that's this thing I just show, showed you that splits water, make another catalyst that makes hydrogen. I won't bother you with it, but we did. And I can put it on silicon, and silicon is the material that's in a solar panel that when light hits it, it makes current, moving charge. I told you I need moving charge. So that's what we did. We took silicon, and again, tomorrow I'll give the details. Don't worry about it. We knew how to do this. You take silicon, sunlight comes in, and then, I just like this because I'm, I told you I'm solipsistic, so I have to put a picture of myself halfway in my, my. Um, When sunlight hits it, I get moving charge. I then send the charge to the catalyst. I energize the catalyst with this current, and then the catalyst operate on water and splits it to hydrogen and oxygen. And in this little movie, I'm literally just, I just have this silicon wafer. This is a tiny one. And I'm just holding it. I've just dropped it into a, a, some regular water, tap water, and hydrogen's coming off one side, oxygen's coming off the other, and it's keeping up with the current of the sun. Now, this is dumb because I'm letting the hydrogen and oxygen mix. But you just put a separator, and off the back side comes hydrogen, off the front side comes oxygen. I've done exactly what photosynthesis does with the sun. I've rearranged the bonds of water using sunlight to make hydrogen and oxygen. You can look at this picture, just put Sundance Film Festival, I came in second I would, against these movie people with my little movie in Sundance Film Festival, and I won the jury prize. But it explains this in a really nice way. Robert Redford, now want, when you win the jury prize, he wants you to make a full-length movie. Don't have time. So if you want to make a movie off of Robert Redford's dime, I can hook you up, but you've got to do it on this. Okay, I told you I wanted to make a hamburger. This is a hamburger. Look. This is the patty, silicon. There's the cheese. I gotta protect the silicon because oxygen reacts with silicon to make sand, SiO2. The top bun is my catalyst. The bottom bun is the other catalyst. It's just coatings on silicon. Simple to engineer, no extra weight, no wiring, right? Um, and we're now making it by a thing called chemical vapor deposition, where I can make all this from the gas phase as things are passing by. All right? So it's really highly manufacturable. And with, we've hit efficiencies of 12.8%. The world's now caught on to this idea. There's lots of people working on buried junctions. They're up to 15%. That's sunlight into hydrogen energy efficiency. So I can make hydrogen really efficient now. So what are you going to do with it? I've solved your problem. I give you hydrogen. What are you going to do with it? This is what you're going to do. You're going to blow up balloons. Because there's no energy infrastructure for you, right? Like, what, you don't know where to use hydrogen. So that's always a problem when you make a discovery that's then disconnected with the current structure, energy infrastructure. So how did nature deal with this? Nature takes hydrogen and it takes it with carbon dioxide and makes fuels. It makes, well, it makes biomass. So we set out, this is only two years ago, the one thing Harvard is good at, very good at, is biology in the med school. So when I got to Harvard, I went and started learning a thing called synthetic biology. I'll tell you what that is soon. But using an organism in genetics, you can encode the organism 
And we thought, could the organism take hydrogen and carbon dioxide and make liquid fuels? So how do we do that? Again, solipsistic, in case you haven't noticed, I have a big nose, so that's why this is my favorite organism. There's my nose. And what we did is we genetically encoded it to breathe in hydrogen. So this organism only eats hydrogen as its food source. And the hydrogen's coming from solar water splitting. So I'm doing exactly what I just told you we did with the artificial leaf. Now I take the hydrogen, I genetically encode this enzyme called hydrogenase in the membrane. The organism takes the hydrogen, it knows how to, once it has a hydrogenase, it gives cellular energy. I can then put a factory, other genes in there and make whatever I want. And I'll explain this tomorrow. With four genes in this bacterium called Ralstonia, we could take hydrogen, it breathes CO2 from the atmosphere, and it makes long chain alcohols, which you can burn as a liquid fuel, and it defecates them out. That's the byproduct of metabolism. So now we can make fuels. And just earlier this year, we showed because I can make water and split it with sun to hydrogen and oxygen, like Alex said in the beginning of her intro, which was incredibly insightful, we can, we're not limited to all the, it, the problems the plant has in terms of energy, using energy and energy efficiency. So the best crops store solar light at 1%, fastest growing crops, switchgrass, soy. The best microalgae are 3%. With this process, because the artificial leaf makes hydrogen at 12.8% solar efficiency, that hydrogen can get fed into this catalyst and it makes liquid fuel. So for, it makes liquid fuel at right here, 7%. Or I could just let the bugs keep growing off hydrogen and I make what are called lipids, biomass, 10%. So I'm now 10% sorry, a factor of 10, so 1% is the best crops, we're at 10% energy efficiency, meaning I'm beating out natural photosynthesis by a factor of 10. Now why is that important? Because that means I don't, I have a less of a footprint. My artificial leaf versus crops, I'm one-tenth the crop area. So if I'm 10 times more efficient, I don't need as much land mass. And the other thing is, I'm not competing with crop, crop soil yields. I have my bacteria sitting over here in a vat, and it's eating the hydrogen from my artificial leaf that's splitting water. So now I'm not competing with crops, land crop, and the land resources. So we really like this. I can tell you a one liter reactor with an OD of what's called two, 99% of the light, it, it's, it fixes 500 liters of CO2 per day of fuels. Okay, now I haven't solved your CO2 problem. Because then you're gonna, this thing's pulling CO2 into, from the atmosphere, it makes a fuel, and then when you burn it, what do you get back? CO2. So I'm not telling you I, you, I can reverse your CO2 problem. You're stuck with that, it's not my fault. But I'm not gonna have you contributing it to it anymore. And you can do this in your backyard if you're poor, because all you need is sunlight, dirty water, the carbon dioxide's there, and just need my bug in an artificial leaf. So this is a distributed way to make fuels from sun, air, and water. You can keep on going, because I could put other stuff in there. Tomorrow I'll talk about how you can make plastics. The last thing I want to tell you is our latest discovery. We haven't published it yet. What else is in the air? Nitrogen. So tomorrow I'll show you another bacteria where we make ammonia and ammonia's fertilizer. Look at what we do when we put our little engineered solar bugs in the ground. These are radishes. When my bugs are in the ground, the radishes grow a lot faster. So we can now do distributed fertilization. The way you do fertilization now is you do Haber Bosch at a big plant that's centralized and you gotta distribute it. Great for a rich country, but if you're poor, you can't build the Haber Bosch plant and you gotta do the distribution for fertilizer. Now, 
using the same concept with the different engineered bacteria, my artificial leaf, some dirty water, sunlight, you can actually do fertilization. You don't need a large Harbor Bosch plant. And this is the rubber hitting the road. These, plant, these guys really grow over 200% faster than without our bacteria. So these bacteria are fixing nitrogen, they're making ammonia, and that ammonia is fertilizing the plant. And for the soil microbiologists, we, in, in between is another microbe that it's working in concert with, but that's not important. You can keep on going. Why well, stop at fertilizer? I could make polymers, I could make drugs, I can make anything I want, that's the power of synthetic biology. It's what genes I introduce into this material. So that guy went to Harvard for one year, and it moved me because he went out into Mars and they couldn't get him back. That's the movie The Martian with Brad, with not Brad Pitt, with that guy. <laughs> and he was a Harvard graduate, and that tugged on my heartstring. I don't want to leave any Harvard graduate on Mars. So we're now talking to NASA, because you can imagine, you're heading out to space. I can use solar panels. I can split water to hydrogen and oxygen. I can feed the hydrogen to the bug, and it can make starches. We're going to try doing that with Michelle Chang, my student at Berkeley. You can make drugs. You could make plastics. You can have a self-sustained atmosphere as you're traveling in space, right? So that's kind of interesting. So that issue with the moon, and rather, sorry, Mars, in this movie is all within reach using just sunlight. And what water would you use? Urine, there you go. That's why I like urine as my water source and my catalyst work in urine. So we'll bring him home. Finally, I just want to end and again, all the science was designed to do things simply that we do at large scale in the developed world with a huge infrastructure. So, and, and I did it this way, forget it. And that's all to help the poor, okay. This guy, I met just before he died because I do a lot of public, I was, do a lot of public things. So he is the ultimate anti-solipsist. So I told you solipsism is you only exist because it's in my mind. He is the anti-solipsist. So here is his argument. And I want you to go home tonight. No matter how upset you get with global warming, you keep hearing people don't believe in it. You probably have a lot of anxiety in the last few months. Don't worry, I want you to think about this. This is what Kurt Vonnegut taught me. And I want to teach this to you. And when you get really depressed, you're going to do this. And it's going to sound weird, but you're going to start smiling, and you're going to feel OK at the end of this. So I'm giving you a tool, a coping tool. I feel I should do that. So he said, the planet is a living organism. And like any living organism, organisms have immunological responses. So when you have an invading organism that can compromise it, the, the irksome intruder, the organism kicks an immunological response in, and it kills it and gets rid of it. So if you have a bacteria, then your immune system gets rid of it when sufficiently compromised. He said, we, as a human race, is suffocating the planet in CO2. And he said, don't worry, the plant the planet is a beautiful living organism, and she has a powerful immunological system. and when we really get irritating to her, she'll just kill us. She'll just let us die in CO2. And the planet's going to be just fine. <laughs> so think of it. I always hear people say, oh, we need to do this to save the planet. No, the planet's going to be fine with a lot of CO2. You just won't be around to see it. So if you think like that, I know it sounds like I'm being kind of me. It's not. It will make you feel happy. Whenever I get really depressed, I keep thinking, good, we were so dumb. We deserve to go. But she is amazing, and she'll stay here. So that's my coping lesson. Use it. You'll find out it's useful. And I'd like to once again thank you for our listening.
Lieutenant, you can stay here. Right. Yeah, so uh, uh, Professor David Britt, uh, uh, distinguished professor of chemistry, will mo be the moderator for the question and answers. So if you have a question, raise your hand, and uh, Dave will moderate. I have so many questions to ask you, um, but I'm going to limit it to one. Isn't this just similar to the HHO experiments that was done during the energy crisis of the 2000s? Yeah. Um, I don't want to talk about that. Uh, so, look, <laughs> HHO is H2O, and somebody dressed it up, and then they wanted to make money, and they had the special magic water that gave hydrogen. And I'll just, here, I'll, uh, there's this thing called the second law of thermodynamics, meaning I can't create energy from nothing. So, like in a lot of these claimed HHO, which they call brown gas, I think, or something like that, yeah, um, you can't, if you're going to split water, you need so much energy. So they do things like this. There's a whole bunch of scams out there. Like, I have a magic powder. Don't worry. It's just a magic powder. Use it, and you'll get unlimited hydrogen. So here's what they're doing is they're using aluminum powder. Aluminum powder reacts with protons, it makes hydrogen. The problem is that's still okay if I can get the dissolved aluminum back to metal using the sun. But it turns out I have to use so much extra energy to get aluminum dissolved back to metallic aluminum to react with water. All the energy I'm getting from hydrogen, I'm using way more energy to rejuvenate it. So that's some of the experiments. Then there are the other experiments, like the HHO, where people say they have a special quantum level. I don't want to get into it. They use a half integer principal quantum number, which violates all quantum mechanics. And when they do Coulomb's law, they get this huge excess of energy. But in general, I'll tell you, there's a lot out there, and it all violates the second law of thermodynamics. So here's my simple suggestion. Do not invest your personal dollars in HHO. Stay with H2O and obey the second law of thermodynamics. And if you're ever going to invest, and you have a question about the second law of thermodynamics, call me. I'll give you free advice for your, for your investment future. But let me just say a good point. That, that whole thing, this what I just talked to you about that really happens was behind that concept. They just were a little shaky on the second law of thermodynamics. And I knew that. Yeah, there you go. Um, I have a question about uh, when you're talking about your calculations that you do to uh, determine the true cost of carbon, uh, you mentioned that you were looking into uh, how much it would cost in order to build more dams and whatnot along coastlines. Are you also taking into account uh, how much it would cost to resettle refugees whose homes get flooded and whatnot? Sure. Do you include that? And in all that? the insurance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So first off, I'm not doing any of that. You're not. Okay. Um, but other people are in the world. And you, you can go on and on and on with the CO2 problems that are going to come. And right now, that hasn't hit, and you haven't paid for it. So smart people are saying, we should do what you're saying, moving homes, moving property, all the insurance losses, we can keep going, going, and get a real cost so people can make investments. So there's, there's some really great hedge fund managers. Those are the ones who usually are doing this, by the way. And, and some of the best ones are in California and I, I'll leave their names uh, off the table, but they are literally trying to do your calculation because they say that's how we want to invest because when this starts hitting, we want to be ready for it and for our customers have their money in the right place. But you're exactly right. We, we, can, we have a laundry list, but right now as a society, guess how much if you put CO2 in the atmosphere you have to pay? Zero. So there's nothing, everything I just told you is a non-starter in this world. Because you're not pricing carbon, it's just easy to dig it out and put CO2 and not pay for it. That's why I'm in the developing world. I'm doing all this in India, by the way. Tomorrow I'll tell you how we're hap making this work in India. Here in the West Coast, uh, we have an, another solar photosynthesis uh, uh, research effort called JCAP. Uh, could you comment on how your technologies relate to what those guys are trying to do? Sure. Everything they're doing um, 
is following what we've discovered and they're trying to make it work better. So they were doing a tif t totally different thing called liquid junctions. They're now doing buried junctions, what I just told you about. Um, they said you had to be in concentrated base and all this stuff. They're now working in borate buffered water. So um, all I'll say is I'm happy to be the guiding light for JCAP. I feel very happy that I could help them. Uh, regarding the ammonia producing bacteria and the radish growth rates, so were your engineered bacteria compared to naturally occurring, nit naturally occurring nitrogen fixing, fixing organisms or just bare dirt? Yeah, so they have, they have a natural nitrogenase in it that's oxygen tolerant, and then we've soup, you gotta soup them up with hydrogenases to bring in hydrogen. So our starting point always is like you're saying, our starting point there was the xanthobacteria, which has a natural height nitrogenase in it. Ultimately, to go super fast, I think what we're gonna have to do is to go to things like, say, thermophilic bacteria and really start pushing the boundary because you're bringing up an important point. When you take natural systems, they work, but they're a little, they're sluggish. If you're gonna do manufacturing, you want high throughput. And so you can always start off with the natural systems, get it to work, like you'll see tomorrow, introduce hydrogenases so they can eat hydrogen, but then you're gonna start hitting a throughput problem, and I think the only way around that is to go to other bacteria and do what you're saying, introduce genetic nitrogenases and things that don't have nitrogenase and keep trying to increase the, the throughput. And so that's really the art of synthetic biology and metabolic engineering. So kind of in a funny way, I'm an inorganic chemist. I'm a laser guy. I study quantum mechanics of how protons couple to ET. And my future in terms of when I look out is synthetic biology for what your reasons you're saying. Um, simple question. When and where is your talk tomorrow and are we all invited and and, and a follow-up um, are you going to get beyond chemistry and explain um, say the three-dimensional configuration of how to make this all work yeah. I mean, you have the silicon panel but then there's bacteria are they on the panel or yeah, are they somewhere yeah, yeah. else is there a separate tank and circulation and what, well what all has yeah. to happen yeah yeah are you going to okay. talk about that this is what I'm going to tell you I'm a dorky scientist you're asking like real life engineering. You don't want me to do that. So what I'm gonna do is tell you scientifically how it works. I think, here, when is it? He'll tell, he'll tell. Uh, Social science uh, 1100 at 4 p.m. Okay, so it's at four o'clock in social science. Um, and then what you're talking about is scale up and, and it's actually going to a pilot scale. And I'm doing that as we speak, but I'm not doing it. So I've gotten Harvard to pass the intellectual property, these discoveries, through for free to India. And the best engineering, one of the best engineering schools in India and in Mumbai is called the Institute of Chemical Technology. And they're doing exactly what you're saying. And because you gotta get hydrogen in these things are sucking CO2 out of the atmosphere. So it becomes, for pragmatically, what you're saying, a reactor design issue. So I'm doing that, but in India, and I'm letting them own everything. I got Harvard to agree to let them own it because I want them to develop it. I want them to prosper off of it. It's just use my ideas and I'll help them. But that's the next step, and the way, I, Dave didn't tell you this, I didn't say this, but um, I did have a company that was successful for grid storage, this part of the world where you can do storage, and that was bought by Lockheed Martin, and they're developing it. And what I did there is I also passed the technology through to Lockheed Martin for development. So what I did at the centralized scale, I'm gonna try to do at the decentralized scale in the emerging world. So I won't tell you what the configuration is because I don't know, but if you give me half a year, I will, but it won't be me. It will be the Institute of Chemical Technology. Um, <clears throat> can you please comment on, uh, based on its current form, the relationship between the carbon footprint, uh, footprint of the production cost yeah. and the lifetime of the technology? Yeah. So, no, because I have to build the pilot. But I'll, I'll tell you what the real carbon footprint is. It's 
producing the silicon, and that's already known. So on a 20-year cycle of a silicon panel, you recover the cost in around a year and a half, all the carbon, because you've got to put it in. And that's what China's doing. So we didn't get into the cost of silicon. But China, because they've built large plants, silicon plants, they're controlling China. China's now controlling silicon output. But usually, in, it's really a silicon question, because my catalysts are only 100 nanometers and very thin. So you, you reco it's basically the time it costs to recover the silicon. Yeah. And I should also say, you're bringing up a bigger point. Oh, this sounds like nirvana, everything. No, whenever you go to large scale, God knows what's going to happen. So you better not have any hydrogen escaping, even though it tends to go right through. Who, you know, you're naive to ever think when I get to super large scale, everything that's happening at a lab or pilot goes forward. You, you really have to build it to answer those questions, and we're in the process of doing that now. Thank you very much for a very interesting lecture. Um, I, I had the question on silicon, but I think you answered that. But there are other geologic materials that are involved in this, in particular cobalt, and you may have other elements. How do you scale? How do you scale those? And these are non-renewable. It's it's you know it's not a very abundant thing. Right. What are you going to do if you okay. scale up? Yeah. yeah. So let me let me answer that. So first, the c amount of cobalt I'm using on a silicon is 100 nanometers thick. It's a true catalyst meaning I never use it up or lose it. So it's basically getting recycled and it's rehealing itself. But I didn't tell you everything. We've also done it with nickel borate and we've done it with manganese too. So, but we've stayed in the first row of the periodic table, which are the cheapest metals. But these catalysts are very active and there's only a thin, thin coating, 100 nanometers thick, and they're truly catalytic. They're not getting used up. So once you have it, you have it. Yeah. Hey, Li Ping. Hi. Um, Li Ping was a graduate student at MIT. Now he's on your faculty. And on that cobalt catalyst, he did all the first density functional theory calculations to help us understand how it works. So go ahead, Li Ping. Thanks. Um, do you think it will ever become viable for one of the major products of the CO2 reduction to be not a fuel or a drug or a plastic, but something you actually bury underground to remove some of the CO2 from right. the atmosphere? Yeah, so that's what's called, so there's, it's called carbon capture and utilization. And we can do that. We really can. I, I'm on a board of Total, and they're really interested in this. In this university, there are people who to geology and they worry about that. So the answer is yes, 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 yes. We can do it. You can turn it into rock. You can keep it down there. So why aren't you doing it? Because it makes your fuel way more expensive. So again, if you're not getting priced for putting carbon dioxide, there's no motivation to do what you're saying. I'm talking about utilization but just carbon capture and storage. Uh, and so that's why none of this becomes a reality in a big way until you're willing to price carbon. Once it costs money to put carbon in the atmosphere, then it's to your economic benefit to bury it. And I will tell you, a lot of the fossil fuel company, oil companies, really believe that carbon pricing's coming down the line. They don't know when it's gonna hit, but they don't want to be caught sideways without a response. So the best carbon capture and storage research going on in the world is all being done by the oil companies. Because the day you guys hopefully decide we're pricing carbon, they don't want to go bankrupt. They want to be ready with the response. So the answer is yes, but you're not going to do it if you don't price carbon. Um, a very nice talk. Um, the efficiency uh, comparisons of photosynthesis and, and uh, your catalysts are really quite impressive. Um, on the other hand, uh, there's always a uh, radiation intensity dependence of the, the quantum efficiency. Yeah. And plants actually adapt to very low light and you know, have to survive very high light and uh, uh, keep their photosynthetic 
apparatus functional at a sort of reasonable quantum efficiency without dying. Yeah. So the catalyst must have a, a range of fluence rates in which it, it functions, and, and light capture could prove to be a problem at low fluences. Yeah, so <clears throat> what you're saying is, I'm totally tied to silica. So that's what I'm tied to. And silicon on the brightest days, which sunniest days here, puts out 30 milliamps per centimeter squared. And so a 100 nanometer thick catalyst can keep up easily at 30 milliamps per centimeter squared. Now, when it's cloudy and you get low light level, you're right, then I have a lower current output from the silicon. So the other way to say this is if I'm in a sunny, so for the poor, for instance, if I could split 100, a bottle of drinking water in a day, the little Dasani thing, I can put out 100 watts. And so 100 watts an hour is 2.4 kilowatts. I would need a silicon panel the size of that door. And, and I could keep up with it. If it's super cloudy because of the lower current, I would have to double, like say it's a super cloudy day. I'm in Bavaria, Germany. I would have to double the size. So what you're, what you're saying is right. The full cost has to be averaged over the solar flux. But these catalysts can keep up. And the reason is, this is another beauty. Photosynthesis, the little catalyst in the plant, so you have a plant the, the photosynthetic membrane is as big as this room, sun is hitting it, and a little pinhead, even smaller, when you look at the area, is the manganese catalyst, and it's keeping up with that solar flux. So it turns out that catalyst in the plant is three orders of magnitude faster than me, my, my one catalyst. But here's the difference. In the plant, it's only one site in this entire room. When I do it on the silicon, I fill the entire room with catalysts. And so I end up going four times faster than the plant because I don't have the problem the plant does of light capture. So I'm, I'm, over, I'm able to overwhelm the system with just more active sites. And that's what I'm doing when I put a 100 nanometer layer on the silicon and therefore can easily keep up with the solar flux on the brightest days. If it gets less, sunny, my catalyst just keeps on going. But then I need more silicon, which goes into cost. Yeah. Great. Okay, well, let's uh, finish with Dean Navratsky with the last question. Okay. So the system that you propose, in a sense, is a hybrid. The initial splitting is done, essentially, by electronics and catalysts and yep. so on. And then all the manufacturing is done by organisms, albeit modified organisms, by synthetic biology. Would you see a system which was either all synthetic biology or all silicon-based? And would there be advantages or disadvantages? Yeah, good. Um, no, I don't see a system all biology, because it just can't do the sun as well as we can in organic. I could see an all inorganic system. Now, What's the problem with that? Um, we're not that great at making carbon-carbon bonds. That's what biology is really good at. So if you go to a chem engineer and you say CO2 plus hydrogen to fuel, in a very narrow thermodynamic window, you make lots of products. You don't do it selectively. And it's very hard synthetically by just pure inorganic materials to make a selective product with lots of carbon-carbon bonds, which the biology does. Um, is it doable? I think it is, and that's why people should keep doing research to go all inorganic. The advantage is, is the throughput idea. Biology finally can go so fast because it's managing a lot of stuff. If it's all dead, meaning all inorganic, it's much, much quicker to turn the system up and increase the throughput. So that's the advantage of an all inorganic system. But all inorganic systems tend to only hydrogenate carbon dioxide, like they may get to methanol,
but they're not, it's very hard to make a long chain fuel and then do it selectively. So that's the advantage of biology, but low throughput. The advantage of chemistry is high throughput possibility, but none of the selectivity. So is there a hope to marry and have the best of both worlds? Yes, because that's what we're supposed to do with that shift happening piece. And I have faith in my community at some level. I just, I'm just a low fruit picker. That's why I went the hybrid way. Okay, well, let's thank Dan one more time. And again, we...